General Nick Halley is a recognized expert on leadership, change management, and integrity. He works with people and organizations that want to educate, inspire, and motivate their leaders to take action now and be better leaders and followers in their organizations. He is available to speak at all types of meetings, conferences, conventions, retreats, training seminars, and for personal coaching. The General's leadership presentations produce concrete results. They take the best of the leadership learned at West Point, combat command of thousands of soldiers, 30 years in the military, and combines those techniques with the most effective leadership lessons learned as a VP and general manager with several prestigious international electronics corporations. His presentations are unique and are based on real-world leadership experience under the most difficult conditions, combat. You cannot get this approach from standard leadership presentations or leadership books. General Halley's military and terrorism-related presentations are based on first-hand combat experience. They provide a unique perspective and are based on graphic inside information. His presentations and seminars are thought-provoking, inspirational, motivating, and informative. The presentations change attitudes and actions. Uh, this general is very dynamic, very interesting, very upbeat, very motivating, and a lot of insights to things that uh, I wasn't expecting. The fact that he like, drew from all his different experiences, not just the military, um, to bring it home, to bring home all his points. It was wonderful. Today there's a new audio tape said to be from that guy, so why can't they find it? Joining us from Chicago now is retired U.S. Army Brigadier General Nick Halley. He's a Gulf War veteran commander. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. Yeah. Why, why is it so tough? Yeah. Well, he's moving from place to place, and, of course, he's moving in population areas where the people are friendly to him. So it's very difficult to find a moving target like that. But just as uh, we did with Saddam Hussein, sooner or later, we'll get him cornered and get him. You know, well, it's great to be here and great to be in North Carolina, and I like to... Uh, Thank Benny for welcoming me back to North Carolina. Uh, you can tell from my accent I'm from the South, but I spent about 10 to 12 of my 30 years in the military right here about one hour away at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, so I feel like I'm going home. As you heard from the introduction, I've been very, very privileged in my life to be chosen to lead tens of thousands of our young men and women in the most difficult leadership environment, combat, and also to be able to continue my leadership uh, time out in the corporate world at Motorola. So my passion in life and my mission has been to take the best leadership lessons that I've learned at West Point and in high levels in the military and high levels in the corporate world and put them together in, in talks and keynotes and training that are designed to teach and motivate and inspire our leaders in our organizations to take action now to be better leaders and followers in their organization. The first is controlling your ego. This is a really tough one for a lot of people. You've got to be able to control your ego to be a good leader. There's lots of people out there that will help you. You know, the main person that will help you do that is your spouse or your significant others. You know, where they say, you know, Mr. General commanded 10,000 people in combat, or Mr. CEO, go take out the garbage. So, you know, your spouse will help you a lot. And also, I've been helped a lot of times in combat situations with my ego, and I'd like to tell you a couple of those. The first one happened in Desert Storm. I was commanding like 10 or 15,000 people, and we were charging up across the Iraqi border. And I was in the group that went all the way up to the Euphrates River, and then we turned east and attacked the Republican Guards. I was in charge of that big group. And if you ever get to the place where you can stop and perhaps get a little bit of sleep, then the driver and your command sergeant major pitch a tent, and all of you stay in that same tent, because even the general stays in that same tent. So up in Iraq on the first day of combat, we'd been fighting all day, and we were getting close to the Euphrates River in a place where we could stop and get a couple hours sleep before we attacked the Republican guards the next day. So I thought, here's my chance for the big airborne ranger commanding general to show the soldiers that I'm just one of the guys and that I can do work just like they can. So as we neared the place where we're going to stop, I said, Sergeant Major, how long is it going to take us, with me helping, put up our tent? And he looked at, up at me very respectfully and said, sir, 10 minutes if I do it, 20 minutes if you help. So, uh, so I thought, you know, maybe there's a message there. So my ego started going down a little bit. And I said, well, Sergeant Major, uh, I think I have some officer duties to attend to instead. And he said, good officer, sir. If you look at throughout the 80s, there were many, many terrorist attacks all over the world. 
none of which we did anything much about, with one exception. There was a time where President Reagan very effectively uh, did a bombing of Tripoli, North Africa, where uh, to get uh, Omar Gaddafi in line, and that was very, very effective. Uh, fast forward on to 1991 in Desert Storm, of which I was a part, and this is an interesting thing to get into if you want to later. We won a terrific victory, and then at the end we let it slip away. That's why we're back in Iraq today. This is WGN Morning News at 7. Good morning. Welcome back. It is 7.30. Joining us now with more on the situation in Iraq is retired Brigadier General Nick Howe. Good morning, General. Good morning. Can you give us uh, some better perspective mm -hmm. on what has been going mm -hmm. on over there? Is this more difficult than you mm -hmm. expected things to be? Well, there's two things happening now based on these recent bombings. One is there's a great increase in the capability of the terrorists. And the second thing is they've clearly changed tactics. So we've got to choose the correct leaders, and then we've got to give them good, continuous leadership training for the rest of their time. And here's a hard thing to say to people that I say to corporate leaders, is that if the people in your organization do not see you in their hearts and in their minds as a leader, if they don't see you as a leader, you will have very limited effectiveness in that organization. Now, you might still be the boss. You might still hire and fire, have the corner office, the nicest suit, stock options. You might have all of those things. But if the people that work for you do not see you in their minds and in their hearts as a leader, you will have somewhat limited effectiveness. Well, at first I really didn't know what to expect. Um, here I'm thinking, okay, military general, the first thing is how much relevance is it going to have to me as a gay man? But the fact of the matter is the, the leadership principles that he espoused were phenomenal. He really showed a very good transition to, uh, to corporate America today. He brought a lot of useful insight into um, ways to be an effective leader and how to, most importantly, how to uh, achieve not only individually but as a company. It was really great. I enjoyed it. Government officials. Joining me now, retired Brigadier General Nick Halley. Uh, General, today's good question. Considering what we saw at Abu Ghraib and what we're seeing day by day, are the terrorists in Iraq changing their strategy? Yes, they are changing their strategy, and they constantly do this. Of course, as you know, since the Iraqi elections, we've been getting much better intelligence information. The last 80 years, through wars and influence by the United States and other freedom-loving countries, we've changed the landscape from about 12 democratic-type governments to about 120. And some of those were impossible tasks. Some of you guys that were in World War II, I'm sure remember all the articles that said, Japan has been ruled by an emperor and warlords for centuries, and there's no way that the Japanese will ever accept democracy. They're a very democratic country now. Nazi Germany. Many people said you can never convert Nazi Germany to a democratic-type country, and we've done just exactly that. WGN military expert Brigadier General Nick Halley joins us now. We're seeing all of these demonstrations uh -huh. on almost a daily basis. Uh -huh. What's your assessment? Well, remember, the uh, Iraqi people have been under a dictatorship for many years, and now there's this tremendous release of, of uh, political energy now. And also, as the piece pointed out, there's three distinct groups there, the Kurds, the Shiite Muslims, and the Sunni Muslims, all of whom have very diverse political views. So as we start making decisions in Iraq uh, for the new Iraqi government, there's bound to be diversity of opinions and demonstrations. I found the first tour in Vietnam that was important for me to carry a rifle. Now, in the military, an officer just carries a pistol because, you know, an officer's not supposed to be doing the fighting, so an officer just carries a pistol. But I learned early on in my career that I needed a rifle because it's got more range, it's got more firepower, so it's important to have a rifle. Plus, the enemy has these guys they call snipers. Guess who the snipers are looking for? You know, some guy prancing around with a pistol, you know. And so I learned early on I needed to have a rifle, so I looked like an enlisted guy instead. Well, anyway, we jumped into Grenada. It was dark. Bullets were flying everywhere. You get all mixed up on the ground in a parachute operation, and then you have to go through a thing the military calls consolidation and reorganization, which is really mass confusion of you running around in the dark trying to find the people that you're supposed to be with. You have that in the corporate world, consolidation, reorganization. It's really mass confusion sometimes. So I landed, got my chute off, and got my weapon, and I noticed about as far from here to the end table that there was a young ranger sitting there firing his weapon as fast as he could because about 100 yards down the runway, we were getting counterattacked by the Cuban forces and the Grenada forces. Now, have any of you ever seen pictures of tracer amp bullets going out? Very, very beautiful. Tracer bullets coming in is not very, very beautiful. So I went over to this young man and trying to figure out what was happening and where I was, and he was firing as fast as he could. And in my best Colonel Ranger voice, I knelt down beside him, 
while he was firing, and I said, Ranger, where are the front lines? And he said, you're standing on them, you dumb son of a blank to be blank. Well, I was a colonel in the Army, and I can tell you, low-ranking people don't call colonel, you dumb son of a blank to be blank. So, uh, and plus, I was on the front lines. That was not very good either. So, so my head started going down a little bit, and I wondered about what, what I should do next, you know, because here I am, a colonel. And before I could think of what to say, he looked over at me and said, are you going to fire your rifle or what? So... <laughs> You know, finally he realized I was a colonel and he was a private and, you know, he was afraid he was going to get court-martialed, but he didn't. So I'll tell you in closing that leadership is very critical for you personally in your personal career and very critical for your business and very critical for the health and the strength of our nation. Because, you know, there's a lot of highs in life. Some of those highs are legal. Some of those highs are illegal. But one of the greatest highs in life is to be a part of an organization of ordinary people through good leadership, gets extraordinarily good results. That's one of the greatest highs in life, and I hope that you can all experience that, because it's very important for us to provide good leadership. I thought his speech was excellent. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, it was filled with a lot of facts and details that normally you don't get, you know, uh, from uh, media. So it was a great uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. But intelligence is not like you see in some movies where somebody finds a manuscript or a microchip and you take it back and you put it on the screen and there's all the plans of the enemy right there. You know, intelligence is a little piece of information here, a satellite photograph there, an intercept from a telephone conversation here, and you put those all together and then you try to find what's going on.